myself would like to give you a very warm welcome to this planning predetermination hearing. In accordance with Section 43 of Local Government in Scotland Act 2003, I've been directed that this meeting will be conducted in such a manner as to allow remote attendance by elected members. The meeting will be live streamed via the Council's website. First of all, any apologies? Thank you, Convener. Yes, we have apologies from Provost Visit, Councillor Stainbank, and Councillor Colley. Thank you. Thank you. That takes us to item two in your agenda papers, which is declaration of interest. And just for clarity, I will read this out. Members should declare any financial and non financial interest they have in any item of business at the meeting, identifying the relevant agenda item and the nature of the interest. Have we any declarations of interest at this time? None. OK, that takes us to item three in your agenda papers. It's the predetermination hearing procedures. And I'm going to pass you on to our legal advisor, Mr Henderson, who will take us through the procedures for this evening's meeting. Thank you, sir. Thank you, convener. And I think while the, the slides are being loaded onto the, the screen, it's probably just worth saying the predetermination hearings of which this is one are required for applications for planning permission for major developments, which are significantly contrary to the development plan, as well as for national developments. This is a, a scenario where officers have considered that the, the, the application is significantly contrary to the development plan. The purpose of a predetermination hearing is to allow the views of applicants and those who have made representations to be to be heard by the planning committee before it takes a decision on the application. So, Jack, if you're OK running through the slides, the, the first point in the procedure is that the, the convener will ask the relevant officer, in this case, Kevin Brown, to present the report that forms part of the agenda papers. Jack, are you OK moving on? The convener will then move on to invite the, the applicant or indeed the agent uh, to speak to the application and their proposal. The applicant has 10 minutes to speak to their proposal. The convener will then ask if any statutory consultees would wish to speak to the application and each statutory consultee who does wish to speak would have a maximum of five minutes to speak to, to the proposal. At that point, it's then available for members of the committee who are joining the meeting tonight to invite questions of the applicant, the applicant's agent or the statutory consultees who have spoken. And indeed, they may seek uh, guidance on any matters from the officers present at the meeting this evening. The convener will then invite parties that have submitted representations to the application, and that could be by way of objection to the application or support of the application, and they're invited to speak to the terms of the representation that they've made. And these parties uh, would normally have five minutes each to speak to the application. I think I've probably preempted myself by saying that they've got uh, five minutes to speak. It's also available for the, the convener to consider whether there's a degree of repetition happening and whether or not it would be beneficial for a spokesperson on behalf of a number <laughs> of interested parties to speak on behalf of the group. If that were to happen, then such a spokesperson would have up to 10 minutes to address the committee. Uh, equally, the, the convener may limit the number of speakers addressing the hearing, and that again comes back to the point about the expeditious uh, conduct of the meeting and avoiding undue repetition of similar points as matters progress. Thanks, Jan. The applicant at that stage will then have a right to reply to any of the points that have been raised by any of the parties that have thus far been heard by the committee. And following that, uh, members of the committee uh, will be invited to question any party that they want to seek further guidance from, or again, they may seek guidance from any of the officers that are in, in attendance tonight. Thanks, Jack. 
Following the, the questions raised by members, it's then available for members of the committee to consider, given what they've heard tonight and what they've seen in the report, whether there are any planning issues that they would wish specifically to see addressed in the report that's finally prepared by officers uh, to be heard at a meeting of the planning committee. And following that point, the, the convener will close the hearing session, will close the meeting. And the next few slides are just covering a, a few procedural points. It's important this meeting is a hearing, it's not uh, a cross-examination of parties. Uh, so it's meant to be conducted in a way so that members of the committee have heard the points that are wished to be made by the various parties in attendance at the meeting this evening. It's not for an argumentative situation to develop and it's important that remarks are directed to the convener and uh, the convener has the decision making power on any matters of order that may arise during the, the course of the meeting. Um, anyone who has intimated that they wish to attend the meeting tonight but has failed to uh, appear at the meeting does not mean that the, the meeting needs to be delayed and it may proceed without that party being in attendance. Again, uh, I think I've touched on this point that the convener is responsible and this is something that flows through all of the council standing orders for the meeting being conducted efficiently but that said, always having regard to the principles of natural justice and that parties are able to, to express views uh, that they may have and that these are heard by the, the committee. And it's also finally worth pointing out, and uh, I think everyone will have seen the report on the agenda. It doesn't come to any conclusions and it's important to note that this is a hearing and it's to gain information on the application for the committee. So it's really important to note that no decision will be taken at the meeting tonight. There will be a future report at a, a, an upcoming planning committee, and it's only at that point that the committee members would then consider the merits of the application and take a decision on the application. And thank you, convener, that completes the procedures. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr Henderson. Uh, before we go on to item four on the agenda, I'd just like to say at this stage uh, a warm welcome to Councillor Flynn. I believe that Councillor Flynn is, uh, is a new member. He's taken over by Councillor Brown and wish you all the best. Thank you, Thank, you. Thank you, Thank you. That takes us to item four in your agenda papers. It's development of land for residential use at land to the north of 41 King's Seat Place, Glendevon Drive, Madison for Manor Forest Limited. It's pages 5 to 34 in the agenda papers, and the report is by officer, Mr Kevin Brown. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, convener. Um, as you've said there, this application uh, seeks planning permission in principle for the development of land for residential use at land to the north of 41 King Seat Place, Glendevon Drive and Madison. Jack, if I wonder if you'd be so kind as to share the screen to show the location plan, please. Thank you. The application site is situated to the immediate north of Cluch Place, Gannell Drive and King Seat Place and is bounded uh, by Nicholton Road to the north and open agricultural land to the east. The applicants propose that the main access to the site be taken from the existing road spur and roundabout to the southeastern corner of the site. In terms of accompanying information, um, with this being an application for planning permission principle, the application is not supported by a set of detailed plans. Submissions at this point are limited to a pre-application consultation report, location plan and planning statement. Section three of the officer report at this stage covers the planning history of the site. Reference here is made um, the previously refused planning application P180151 PPP for development of this land for residential use, as well as a summary of the local plan examination report where the reporter recommended that the site not be not be included within the Falkirk Local Development Plan 2. Section 3 of the report also includes a summary of the pre-application consultation undertaken by the applicants in advance of this application. In terms of consultation responses um, re received today, these are summarised in section 4 of the report. The responses received today 
make requests for various additional information to be submitted, including a draft road layout, transport assessment, noise impact assessment, contaminated land assessment, air quality impact assessment, coal mining risk assessment, flood risk assessment and drainage impact assessment. A response from NHS Forth Valley is still awaited and Children's Services has requested developer contributions towards nursery, primary and high school investment. In terms of public representation, we have received a total of 63 representations to date, consisting of two neutral comments and 61 objections. The, point of obje the points of objection are raised, raised are summarised in paragraph 6.2 of the report. Finally, in section 7 of the report goes on to highlight the relevant policies within the Falkirk Local Development Plan 2, as well as additional material considerations in the form of Scottish Planning Policy, Draft National Planning Framework 4, Falkirk Council Supplementary Guidance, Public Representations and the Planning History of the Site. Thank you, Convener. Okay. Thank you very much, Kevin. It's now an opportunity for the applicant or the agent to speak in relation to the application before us. Now, who's it going to be? Is it, could you maybe introduce yourself, whoever it is? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Convener. My name is Andrew Benny. I'm a director of Andrew Benny Planning Limited, and I'll be responsible for the principal or for the main part of the presentation this evening. And I'll also be joined at the end of my presentation uh, by Alistair Bell, who will address one specific aspect uh, of relevance to the consideration and determination of the application. Thank you, Convener. Thank you. You have 10 minutes, sir. Yeah, thank you. Uh, on behalf of my client and in support of my client's planning application, I could have, first of all thank members uh, for the opportunity to provide this brief outline of the information which I consider is of importance and relevance to the ongoing consideration and ultimate determination of the application. Um, in further support of my, my client's proposals for the development of this site, I would first of all wish to highlight the important fact that the Council has accepted that a shortfall in effective housing land supply exists with it being noted that the report before members today puts this shortfall at 122 units. Whilst both noting and welcoming the Council's acceptance that this shortfall exists, I would advise members that the extent of this shortfall significantly exceeds the 122 units which has been suggested by the Council. Within the terms of a recent appeal decision relating to the residential development of a site at Old Bellsite Road, Larbert, uh, that decision being issued on the 2nd of December last year, the reporter concluded that the extent of the shortfall in the effective housing land supply amounted to some 632 units. Given this independent finding, it is disappointing that the extent of this shortfall as determined by the reporter in that case has not been reflected or indeed mentioned within the report which is before members today. The nature of the development planning system is such that this shortfall in effective housing land supply cannot be addressed through the next iteration of the local development plan, this being due to the timescales involved. And as such, the only way that this shortfall can be remedied in the short term is through the, through the granting of planning per permission for windfall housing sites. In circumstances when a shortfall in effective housing land supply has been identified, Local Development Plan Policy HC01 states that additional housing sites will be supported, which are sustainable development, having regard to the relevant criteria set down within Scottish planning policy. I would advise members that the Local Development Plan Policy H2 does not require all of these principles of sustainable development to be met. Rather, the application of Policy HC1 is to be guided by the principles of sustainable development. With regards to a number of the principles, support for the proposed development is clear, uh, this being particularly so with regards to the first two principles, given the proposed development will create economic benefit and will respond positively to economic objectives. And I would make clear to members that housing delivery and meeting housing needs, including through the provision of affordable housing, are recognised without question as being contributors to sustainable development. The third criterion requires consideration to be given to the six qualities of place. While no, whilst no details of the form of development proposed are put forward for approval at this uh, part of this application, I would advise members that there is no reasonable basis upon which it, it could be concluded that each of these qualities could not be satisfactorily and fully addressed at the detailed design stage, noting that through careful and considered design, the proposed development 
will become a safe, pleasant and adaptable place. Careful design will also ensure that suitable levels of connectivity with adjacent housing areas are secured and the ease of movement within the development is provided for. Whilst located in the periphery of the existing built up area, the application site benefits from the same level of accessibility of the local services and facilities as is enjoyed by much of the existing housing stock within the wider area, with these services and facilities being within a 20 minute walk of the site, this being in line with the advice set out within planning, policy, planning advice note 75, planning for transport. In terms of the demand that the proposed development would place on schools, roads and other infrastructure, I would advise members that all of these matters can be addressed through planning agreement, which would control the required developer contributions and also by conditions. And I would note that in particular, the Council's education services has accepted that the educational impacts of the proposed development can be addressed in full by way of developer contributions. Members should also be mindful of the fact that the proposed development will deliver 25 of its overall capacity in the form of affordable housing in accordance with LDB policy HCO3 affordable housing. In the context of policy PE18 and supplementary guidance SG09 landscape character and landscape designations, I would advise members the application site does not lie within the green belt and is not covered by any local landscape designations. In light of these considerations, it is my respectful submission that the, de that the development which is under proposed under this application can be fully and reasonably justified against the relevant provisions of the development plan. Further to this submission, I would also like to take this opportunity to advise members that the de development of this site provides the key to realising the delivery of the Council's approved vision for the development of the Madison East Strategic Development Framework Area. The provision of the missing section of the local distributor road, which will link through the exi link the existing roadway at Glen Devon Drive eastwards to the approved junction on the A801, forms a critical component of the development framework and is key to the delivery of the overall development. And I consider it to be of the utmost importance that members understand and appreciate that of necessity, this missing section of the local distributor road must pass through the application site. Uh, and perhaps at this point I could pass over to my colleague Alistair Bell, who will provide an insight into the Council's rationale for the level of design associated with Glen Devon Drive. Thanks, Alistair. Thanks, Bell. Yeah. You're on mute, Mr. Bell. Oh, still on mute, Alistair. Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh dear. No. Back on mute, Alistair. As you know, no, back on again. No, still on mute, Alistair. That's you. That no, back on. That's you now. Thank you. My apologies, convener. I'm uh, not of the use that uh, requires uh, to use this technology. <coughs> My name is Alistair Bell, and uh, as you yourself know, convener, I was a former employee of Pocket Council Planning Department. I first became involved in the uh, Madison East development issue. Around 30 years ago, uh, forward planning is a long term process. <coughs> Our interest uh, in this area was the requirement to meet the housing requirements for the, the wider Falkirk area. And as you, as you know from your own local plan, this is one of 12 strategic growth areas. The major problem, the outstandingly major problem we had was the poor quality of road connections to the main road network, especially to the M9 and, and down to Falkirk Town Centre. We really are very limited. People are pushed down uh, through Quarry Bray, past the station, station road onto the main road in Palmont to go along to Lathallon Roundabout. And there are a number of problems with that road. They also have to get down through uh, Reading and down towards Lauriston Cross. And again, there are problems. Our answer to that was to create a link to 
the A801, and the only area that that link could be provided was through this area, Park Hall. So it's been a long-standing commitment, uh, from my point of view, to achieve that. Now, there's no point coming up with a plan which isn't feasible. It has to be deliverable, and it can only be delivered with the use of this site, because there's no other way of getting a road from Devon Drive through to A801 without using the application site. It's quite simple as that. Uh, it's been recognised by planners. It's unfortunately, I think, not put in the local plan, which makes the local plan difficult to deliver. Um, in particular, sites H15 and H13 will simply not be built uh, unless some access is put through this land. Now, that's my long-standing history of the site. Um, I can't say any more than that. Thank you. Uh, okay. Thank you, Anna. I'll just quickly finish off, convener. Uh, given what exists on the ground, uh, there can be no doubt that when it was constructed, as Alistair has said, the existing section of Glen Devon Drive was designed to full distributor road standard, with this high standard of design being insisted upon by the council because of the simple fact that the council intended that in due course, the road would serve as a local distributor road that would extend eastwards to link with the A801, all as detailed within the development framework. The purpose of this framework is to inform and guide the design of the proposed development and to assist in its delivery. This delivery aspect of is import of importance as it raises the issue of in infrastructure funding. In general, infrastructure is delivered through funding generated by development, oft often in the form of developer contributions. In the case of the Maris and East development, no contributions have been gathered from any of the consented or completed development parcels. Um, and, as, and it is only through the development of the application site that the funds necessary to generate the complete the construction of the Tricipital Road eastwards to uh, the A to one can be generated. And without the development of the application site, the overall development envisaged for within the Maris and East development framework simply will not be realised. I thank members for allowing me to make this short presentation and in due course we'd be pleased to answer any questions which members may have. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much uh, Mr Benny and Mr Bell. And um, Before we bring in members of the committee to ask any questions, I'd just like to check whether there are any statutory consultees with us this evening that would like to speak. Non intimated, that's fine. Now, an opportunity for members of the committee. You're invited to question the applicant or the agent. Um, obviously, there's no statutory consultees and seek guidance on factual or legal matters from the officers after the presentations you've just heard. So, uh, I'm in your hands now. Any questions for members to anybody? No? No, OK. Now it's an opportunity. Convener, convener. Yes, Councillor Kerr. Yeah, uh, my hand goes up. Uh, with your indulgence, I, I get some clarification on some points, convener. Carry on. Uh, firstly, how long has this application been in? I don't know if you'll be able to answer, Kevin. Um, it's it's around about a year now, I think. Yeah, I don't have the exact date in front of me. Um, be with me. Sorry, I've been logged out of the the system that, that has that answer for me. I'm afraid it, it's it's certainly around about a year though. Um, the application reference numbers. Uh, P21, so that's a, that's a, yeah. a 2021 uh, reference and it was towards the end of that year, but um, I, I would need to come back to you and clarify the data in our time, I'm afraid. That's fine, Kevin. If you get that for, for it when it comes back. I'll do it. Uh, the reason I'm asking that is uh, there's certain questions that we're asking that says that the applicant has not brought forward. Surely, uh, 
through that time, we had the opportunity to get in dialogue with the applicant unless they weren't uh, available to, to comment. Uh, has there been dialogue over this period of time, Kevin? There hasn't been extensive dialogue in terms of the, the, the level of information submitted. I've, I've passed on the consultation responses received to date. Part of the um, uh, stages of the application process is, 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 is where we are at the moment. The, the predetermination hearing is a key part of establishing what additional information may be required as part of the assessment of the application. Um, so I, I, it would be my intention that following um, tonight's meeting that there would be a further dialogue with the applicants to, to establish exactly what additional information is, is required before we can come to a recommendation on the application. Right, OK, Kevin, thank you for that. Uh, another matter with regards to guards on burn it says that there, there's, there could be risk of flooding there. It doesn't show you in the detail uh, where that burn actually runs. Can we, uh, for the, the meeting, can we get a, a, so we know where it is? Because obviously uh, if it's the same burn that runs through Gilson, our colleagues and officers didn't think there was going to be a problem there, eh? So I just want to see if it's if it's the same burn. Are there any dancers now, Kevin? I just for when we come back to uh, when it comes back to to come out to come out to. Yeah, uh, sorry, the, 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 sorry, my my understanding the guard room burn is the the burn that runs to the north of the application site. The, there's a there's a further burn to, towards the south of the, the towards the, the Gilson farm area, the Manuel burn, um, which isn't isn't referenced. Right. Um, so yeah, we can clarify in any future report, um, in more detail any any flood right. risk that, elements. That's that's much appreciated. See on, on page twenty seven, the Scottish Planning Policy two thousand fourteen. Is that still the same planning policy that we've got? Or has that been superseded by anything else? It's still the same document at the moment. What, what we have at the moment is the, the policy situation uh, is in a period of flux. You could say that the, the national government are, are looking to introduce the national planning framework. Yeah. Um, and, and that's in a, a, at this point in time, it's still in draft form, but it's, 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 it's as I understand, very close to becoming a, a, an adopted document. Maybe tomorrow, oh. Kevin, is. Yeah. Potentially. Thanks, <laughs> Kevin. We'll bring in Mr. Dryden on that particular point because I think it's of great interest yeah. to everybody. Thank you, Kevin. Through you, yeah, I think that's a useful point just to clarify an update, as you'll see in the report before you this evening. Obviously, it's showing the MPFA, obviously, for its currently in process. But as you probably, many of you now know, it was approved last week at the Parliament. And we've actually just received the Chief Planner's letter which ind indicates their intention to actually adopt, approve MPF on the 13th of February. So clearly at this point in time, it's not part of your development plan. However, from the 13th of February, yes, that is the intention. It will become that. So there is some guidance in the letter which advises in the interim and up to the 13th of February that while it's now been approved by Parliament, it is a material consideration. So just to give context, and that's something we'll have to consider. And then maybe as a committee, you may wish to ask the applicant and the regent to maybe make comments, observations on the emerging policy in MPF 4, because it is now becoming a relevant consideration. And obviously at this point in time, because the application has been in over a year, clearly the nice of MPF 4 has not had the same weight until now. So it's certainly something now that we'll certainly be giving consideration to. OK, thank you. Councillor oh. Kerr? Yeah, uh, probably another one for Kevin. It says on page 9, 4.3, transportation noise regarding the railway line. Would it be uh, possible for to get a rough estimate of how far that is away, Kevin? Or when we come back to committee? Yeah, I can, uh, I can include that in any future. Right, report. thank you. 
with with regards to, I don't know if it'll be yourself or it'll be Mr. Dryden, Kevin, uh, and it was mentioned by Mr. Benny regarding uh, it's on page twenty eight, seven uh, B point six, the house and land supply. With it states in here that we have a four point eight years land supply. Is does that only come into play when all sites and LDP two come into play? So uh, they would need to all come in built or started. Is that correct, Mr. Ryan? Okay. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah th thanks, Councillor Kerr. That's something. Well, Alex Lewis from a plans, planning policy. Oh, right. I, I, I never know here, Alex. Alex. To come in, but effective housing and land supply, as you're correct, it says in paragraph 7b6 on page 20, explains the situation that we were at the time of writing that report. I don't think much change to that. So it's certainly material and relevant to obviously the consideration of this, this application. And that's something certainly following the, obviously the hearing tonight, we will obviously be making our uh, comments and observations on that, particularly with regard to obviously the emerging MPF4, which I outlined earlier this evening, that's now going to have uh, certainly uh, weight as well. So we'll have to look at all this in the round, but certainly as it stands just now, unless Alex has anything else to add to update since the, 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 the comments in the report before you this evening, we have certainly can confirm we've got a deficiency, but that's something we'll need to obviously take a nice and solve. Obviously, the comments have been made by Mr. Benny this evening as well. And we'll obviously, when we bring this back to the next available planning committee for determination, we'll obviously provide comments and observations from officers for your consideration. Yes, I would just I would just um confirm what, what Mr. Dryden just said. Um in that we currently do have we, we, we do have a small shortfall a small shortfall. Uh, we've currently got a supply of uh, four point eight years um at this point in time. So obviously the policies um within SPP and uh, the draft MPF four would be would be relevant at, at, at this time. So I, I don't know if you got the question that I asked. So the we're 59 sites in LDP2, which 53 of them came for LDP1. Uh, what I'm asking is, will all these sites need to be developed for us to meet a 4.8 years land supply? Uh, not necessarily, Councillor Kerr. Um, the, the sites have varying levels of effectiveness which are assessed through the housing land audit. Um, it may well be that um, some some of the you know it will be that some of these sites are brought forward sooner than others and the housing land supply is assessed on an annual basis through the housing land audit. So on an annual basis uh, we then assess um, how each of the sites, not just LDP sites, but uh, non-LDP sites as well, um, all of which contribute to the overall supply. We would make an assessment on an annual basis as to what, if we have a shortfall and what that shortfall is. So there's various sites, LDP sites and non-LDP sites, which would which would contribute to to the overall, you know, the overall the overall supply. OK, I, I don't think I'm asking what I was asking, but I'll take it offline and I'll get in contact with Alex to ask right. you the, the, the question that I was trying to get you. But thank, thank you very much to everybody. Thanks, Karina. Uh, Councillor Kerr, just to let yourself and the, the rest of the committee know that there will be an opportunity to go out and cite um, before it comes back to committee. And I think that will be a very worthwhile exercise for everybody. OK, yeah, thanks, is there any other... Karina. Thank you. Is there any other member of the committee like to ask any questions at this stage? Councillor Redmond and then Councillor Bowes. Councillor Redmond. Thanks, Kevin. Um, just a couple of questions. We're talking about this distributor road. Um, have we got uh, plans in place with the, like, with the council to take this all the way down? Because I can see on page 34 at the back, uh, we've got the drawing, but it seems like the Fallon roundabout is quite a, a distance away from that. Is, is the aim that the developer contributions would pay for that whole road or is 
the council to part finance it. And I don't know if uh, maybe Gary could come in on that one, but have we got plans around that road yet? Is that? You can be a, um, I, I think I'll pass that one to Craig Russell. Um, I think yeah. Councillor Redmond, that was possibly a, a, a comment that, that Mr Benny made as the, the applicant's agent. Um, so it possibly would be worthwhile getting his involvement in this as well. All right. Okay, Craig, and then Mr Benny. Yeah, thank, thanks, convener. I think uh, I, I'm going to defer this one to colleagues in uh, planning and environment. The they authored the Madison East Development Framework uh, paper, which which discusses the the distributor road. Um, I'm not aware of a mechanism to deliver that, and maybe developer contributions. It may not. It wouldn't be appropriate for me to comment on that. Okay, thanks for that, Mr. Benny. Want to come in and give us any information on this uh, question of importance? Yes, um, the, the aspiration in terms of the provision of the link road is set down within the development framework document and effectively council it's going to be a link between the existing roundabout terminus and Glen Devon Drive looping up and then heading eastwards towards the A801 where approval already exists for the creation of a new roundabout just to the south of the canal. So it doesn't doesn't go down towards Lothallan roundabout, the junction goes or the road would effectively go from Glen Devon Drive north then eastwards to connect to the A801 just north of the Hayding nursing home. Uh, and it's, um, officials have said the entire section of that road would be uh, provided through direct funding by developer, would be provided by direct funding from developers. There wouldn't, um, as far as I'm aware, uh, be any requirement on the council's part to assist in any way, shape or form to the funding of that road. Okay, thank you. We're going to bring in Ian to the conference. Alex, Hello, yes. Um, thanks, Convener. Um, the Madison East Development Framework does indeed set out uh, um, a distributor road link through to the A801. Uh, this was reflected in um, LDP2 uh, development guidance. Uh, the Madison East Major Areas of Change development guidance shows a link coming from uh, the roundabout at the end of Glen Devon Drive, uh, linking into housing allocated housing site H13, uh, and then potentially this would go through allocated housing site H15 at Park Hall at Park Hall Farm. Um, this would then be required to go through um, other allocated housing sites, um, linking through eastwards to a new roundabout at the, at the A801. Uh, this would link, I don't know, members may recall that there um, was extant, there was there was planned consent, uh, it was minded, minded to grant consent for um, ha um, retirement housing at um, housing site H18, um, just adjacent to the Union Canal, and it was thought that there would be a roundabout link uh, from the 801 into this site. So the exact line of where the road would be drawn would obviously be subject to whichever applications come forward um, in the future. But it's thought, you know, it, 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 it's likely that the distributor road will have to pass through, you know, one or more other housing sites in which to get to a new a new roundabout on to the 801. Thank you. Back to you, Councillor Redmond. Um, ah, that's, that's it's interesting. It's maybe still no. I'm sort of getting what they're saying. But it's maybe still no clear. It's good to hear that uh, we think we can fund it through developer contributions. Uh, I think it might be worthwhile if we could maybe get some drawings to show us what the potential routes for the road would be just going yeah. forward. And then maybe as well, because I know it's Madison's quite a big area, so you know, we've got a street here and at the end of the street is a roundabout that goes to nowhere, but if that did go down to another roundabout which led on to Lothallan, it could really increase the traffic going through Glen Devon Drive, so it'd be, it'd be interesting to have a, a bit of information on that. Um, I had another question was um, about the, the amount of 
the amount of homes that would be, I know it's just princi in, planning in principle, but have we got any idea the amount of homes intended to be built on this site, a rough estimate or anything? Mr Benny, maybe yourself, sir. Uh, thanks, Convener, and thanks, Councillor. At th uh, this stage, we've not carried out any form of um, detailed design assessment to see or to attempt to define what the natural logical capacity of, of the site is. So, unfortunately, I don't have a straightforward answer for you at the moment. Um, perhaps one of the easiest things to do, Councillor, uh, is simply look at the size in relation to the existing development centred on Glen Devon Road, and it will give you a rough idea of, of the numbers. So I'd, I'd be lying if I could say 200, 300, 400. I think that would be unfair to my client and would potentially give you uh, an unfair reflection as to what the optimum carrying capacity or design capacity of the site is. OK. Yeah, that's fine. That, uh, thanks. Um, I think that's all the questions I had. Uh, there. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Can we uh, start around? Yeah, uh, what you come in on, Mr Bell? Uh, Councillor Redmond's comment about the Link Road. The, the Link Road, was, as I understand it, will be funded entirely by the developers. But in all cases, it has to be through land owned by Manor Forest, the applicant here. There's no other way to achieve that. Um, I'm not sure whether Ms Lee Lewis is aware of that fact, but there's no way to achieve access to this entire Madison East development without going through land owned by Manor Forest. Okay. Yeah, there's there's um there's the the roundabout link will be required to go through site. Um, well, it 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 it's it will either have to go through the site in question or it'll have to go through site H13, which is an allocated site in the LDP in LDP2, which is owned by Manor Forest. Which is both of which are owned by Manor Forest. So that's, that's a point. Of that's fact, yes. Most sites okay. have to go through your options involve Manor Forest. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay, thank, thank you, Mr. Bell. I think that's how it's going to be beneficial for everybody that can make it to the ground site and a lot of these questions we've seen and the physical side of it. Um, Councillor Burns. Yeah, thank you, convener. Um, three questions, I think, um, and mostly, I think, to officers. Uh, Kevin had noted at the start of his presentation that the reporter had originally refused this site for LDP2. Can we get uh, uh, the, the explanation why it was refused? Because returning something back to the reporter, uh, again, which has already been refused by the reporter, um, uh, would be, um, well, I, I would like to know that before I, before I made my decision. Um, on, the, on the housing, Land supply, uh, Mr. Benny, I, I quite, I quite happily, um, happily is the wrong word. I read the full um, notification of decision to refuse Bensfield Park, uh, I, and obviously the there was, it was, it was interesting reading how the two different forms are calculating the the supply are shown, but ultimately. Yeah, to rely on that on a, a, something that was already refused. It obviously didn't carry, carry enough weight um, on that. It might be worth, if there's maybe a better, uh, and I suppose it's either Kevin or Ian Dryden, is, is maybe, um, is, well, you're using that as an example because it does actually tell you quite well how how, how the, the two different qualifications come out, or, or, or Alex, it might, it might be yourself. Um, I'm obviously relying on uh, and trust what, what, Alex, what Alex says to us. On this application itself for a PPP, um, I find that, and, and uh, this is not a, it's not a criticism of Kevin or, or, or Mr Benny either, but we're really light on information on this PPP. Um, the amount of things that have still got to be reported on um, to actually give us um, the information that we need to actually make a decision. Um, can I ask Kevin, is there going to be, when it actually comes before committee, is there going to be more information than what, what actually exists here for the PDH? Ultimately, that's down to the developers to um, what, what information they 
are willing to provide. Um, there, there is a request for various documents and, and assessments to be carried out through the consultee, consultee process. Um, the applicant's aware of, of those elements. Um, there will have to be a discussion, I would imagine, after, after today's meeting. Um, if there's any additional elements that need to be expanded on as well, uh, and then it then involves really in the applicant's court at that stage as to whether, whether they wish to sub they submit that information before recommendation or not. So yeah, that's one for the one for the applicants, I'm afraid. I can't speak for yeah. the rest of the committee, but just just for myself, um, obviously uh, a PPP stage. Um, um, I would like to see um, a lot more information, and and, yeah. and and I'm actually referring to the request that you've put you've put in. There. But 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 thank you for that, and, and that's me. You know, your convener, you'll be pleased to hear. No, no, I'm going to come back to you, Mr. Uh, Councillor Bowers, because the first two questions you asked, I think Mr. Grimes when he came in and update you on it. Thank you, Convener. Through you, yeah, Councillor Bowers, just obviously you, you raised the point about the history regarding the allocation on or the report at the time to the LDP2 not to obviously carry this site forward. The actual report before you this evening on page 7, paragraph 3.3, .3, provides a summary of the reporter's conclusions at the time of the LDP2 to explain what his reasoning why he decided not to allocate this site as part of the LDP2. The point you're raising about the methodology of housing land calculations, uh, US for Redfield Farm, very relevant actually in the chief planner's letter that has been issued. There is specific mention of transitional arrangements being provided by Scottish Government uh, in conjunction with the approval of MPF4, and it talks about the deliverability of the housing policy. So mm -hmm. we await with interest, obviously, in this next month of what that will be. Uh, Alex may wish to come back and to clarify that, but it has been on, on a long standing issue about the methodology of the calculation. So hopefully, the transitional arrangements that we receive uh, in the next month or so will hopefully put clarity to that point. And then finally, the point of the request for information, as Mr Brown said, and again through yourself and others on the committee, you may wish to decide through this, the hearing uh, this evening to be specific of what information you would require uh, uh, us to ask of uh, uh, on your behalf to the applicant, obviously the applicant and his agent uh, are on the call this evening. So it's to yourself if there's any particular information you specifically wish to ask for, then we can certainly provide that or, or through, the, through the agent we're on the call. OK. Thank you. Thanks, Mr Dyden. Councillor Murta. Thanks, Camina. I suppose it's similar to follow on from, from Councillor because I agree with his uh, you know, summation about the level of detail. And I think the issue here is, and obviously we're, we're reading about that, you know, we, we've got a, a, an application here which is significantly contrary to the LDP2. Um, and as the agent was saying, you know, when we come to make the judgment about whether we can consider, um, given that, you know, we acknowledge the the, effect, the shortage in effective housing land supply, and I know we can argue about the calculation of the units and, and have some discussion about that, but it's very difficult um, for us to be able to determine with such little information um, whether there are material, whether it is a sustainable development and all the things which we'll have to go and apply through the policy. So whereas I prefer to ask the questions at the end of officers to put things in the report, well, the agent um, is here. I suppose it, it is that way that although you're saying you don't have at this stage an accurate um, ability to say how many houses, etc., I suppose for, for you to understand, from certainly speaking for myself, understanding the nature of the development, especially what's been said in the text from the reporter in terms of looking at the site and the concerns about overcapacity and overwhelming, uh, given what's already in the Madison East area uh, in those plans, it's to sort of say, can you therefore be able to provide more information that will enable an assessment of whether this site will be uh, sustainable in that regard and in, in terms of you already listed you know what the criteria that they're looking at and um, because that will be a major concern in terms of when we come to the application and we look at whatever the officer's view making that judgment in, in terms of sustainability because at the moment you know you, you can say well in the, in the previous one where we said we had an effective pricing land a shortage of 122 units we have no idea at this stage about how many units we're talking about and whether we can judge that in terms of the sustainability of, of uh, you know, the capacity overall of that area. So the more detail that we can get um, to understand that, the better I would say, and just to make that point at this stage to the to the applicant agent at the moment, um, so that we can get a better idea. And, and that may feed into things that we ask plan officers to come back to, but just to make it at this point, uh, I thought it would be helpful. 
I, I'm quite sure that Mr. Benny has been listening to this. It is an important issue in relation to the, the numbers game here, and then I'm quite sure that between now and this coming back, that there hopefully will be a lot more information. I think Councillor Kerr state, stated at the very beginning, he asked what, what dialogue had been going on for the for the past year, and then um, hopefully there will be much more dialogue coming on before we're ready to determine this issue. OK, if there's no other members of the committee, it's an opportunity now for other persons who have submitted representations, including the objectors or supporters, to speak in terms of their representations. Each party will permit you to address the committee once for up to five minutes. At this particular time, I have four objectors, no supporters. I'm just going to read out the names and then they can let us know if they're with us. John Crawford. Are we a John I'm Crawford? Here. Yes, sir. Have you just yes, Fine, thank you. A Michael Wilson. Have we a Michael Wilson? No. Lynn Hobbs. Yes, I'm here, convener. That's fine. And a Richard Kingston. I'm here, convener. That's fine. OK, we'll start off with uh, John Crawford. Uh, John, you have five minutes to put your representation to the hearing. Thank you, sir. Thank you, convener. Uh, good evening, uh, Kwe. Um I was too strong object to this uh, Manor Forest uh, planning application. Um, I live in Maniston. I've lived in the area for over 25 years, and there is already a, a number of uh, large housing developments in progress or planned. Um, if this planning application was approved, there would be a detrimental impact on the local and surrounding area. There would be an increase in noise and disturbance from a further undisclosed housing and possibly 100 plus houses, however, more recently, probably 200 plus additional houses, given the size of the countryside area that's been requested here. An increase in the traffic and air pollution on Glendevin Drive, which already has congestion at peak school times, uh, therefore an increased risk to school children from additional traffic in the vicinity of the local primary school and its nursery. Uh, detrimental impact on the local school with increased class sizes. The school is nearly full. Um, I've, had, I've got kids at the school. Uh, detrimental impact to local doctor surgeries where we already struggle to obtain doctors and other health related appointments. Um, there's currently 72 family homes being built right now by Miller Homes, uh, which excludes a, a, a number of affordable housing, which would take this over 100 units at the station Bray which is a site recently vacated by the Fire Brigade HQ. There is also a housing building uh, nearing completion by Persimmon Homes at Park Hall Meadow Estate on the road, which was about, I think it was 60 units. So at the moment, I'm currently surrounded by two house builders um, on two sides. Um, loss of green space, um, along with uh, what the neighbours from the surrounding estates use this uh, area, the northern, the northern field, as we call it, uh, for walks and to walk the dogs. The area was used extensively during COVID for people to go out for walks. Uh, the Nicolton Road is also blocked off to allow people access um, so they would be safe walking down due to the number of people using the area. Um, lots of country and wildlife, you regularly see foxes, rabbits, badgers, birds, and occasional deer in the northern fields, which the kids love to see. Also, personally, when we buy a house um, and before we purchase, we instruct a lawyer to check the local development plan to see what's planned in the area and any future building or industrial or residential. Um, the use of countryside greenfield land for housing should not be allowed developers and housing should simply respect Falkirk Council's local development plan and use land already earmarked for house building. Thank you. OK, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, if you just turn the line, because obviously members may have questions of yourself uh, later yep. on. It's an opportunity okay. now um, for Lynn Hobbs to come forward. You have five minutes, Lynn. Thank you very much. I won't take up much time because my objections are similar to what's already been raised by the gentleman before me. Um, I have some concerns around about the impact on the environment. The increased traffic and as the gentleman's already pointed out, I've already raised several concerns um, around about peak school times and 
and the amount of traffic that's already coming down Glen Devon Drive and there's been periods I've struggled to get to my own house down at the bottom of I'm in King's Seat Place right next to the field and um, so I've struggled to get there and I've had some serious concerns about children coming in and out that school at peak times um, and if we're increasing the traffic through there I'd have significant concerns about that as well as the impact on the environment and um, as the gentleman's pointed out the use of the fields and the, the wildlife and everything that comes with being next to those fields and my main concerns are on the impact you know this is a village it hasn't been set up to be as a town or a city and there's not a lot of facilities up here and that's what you choose when you choose to come and live here the schools already had to build an extension because of the amount of building that's gone on in madison in recent years and the gp surgery you cannot get an appointment because it's also struggling and full and um, so the impact of up to 100 more houses on that is only going to add to the impact of madison primary school as well as the gp surgery and ultimately brace high school because that's the cluster for where those children would go on to when they move on to go to high school and um, so it's the, the, my concerns are similar to what the gentleman's already made so i won't take up much more time i would agree with everything he said and that would that's why i objected to to the further building in the area OK, thank you, Lynn, and thank just say, say to your colleague, if you'll, you'll hold on, because there might be an opportunity for questions to be asked to you. Richard Kingston. Hi there, thank you very much, convener. If I can give um, a few very short views, I promise I won't take up the full five minutes. Um, I would also like to object to the planned application. Um, I think at the time of the previous planning application for the same area, there was a report from the charity Iris, which was done in conjunction with Madison Community Council. Uh, the report's primary data arose from interviews and questionnaires with people living in Madison, and I think that some of the themes and concerns that were raised then are still very relevant. And to summarise them very briefly, um, these were an absence of physical places and spaces to socialise, to bring people together. There was no, no local GP surgery, no health clinic. Uh, there were no significant facilities for cultural or sort of sporting leisure activities, and there were insufficient spaces generally for younger people as well. I would also say that although we've got local shops that are certainly very well appreciated and they're well used, they're not able to cater to everyone's needs. Um, and I suppose I would also echo the views of others which have been concerns about primary and secondary school capacity, traffic flow and risk on the roads in the area. And I would also add, I think, broader health and well-being services which are not local to Madison at present, including mental health services. Uh, the population of Madison and Rumford has hugely increased over the past couple of decades and local services and facilities haven't kept pace with this expansion. I think that makes the area feel quite fragmented and I'm uncertain that any of these concerns have been addressed since the last application and I think they would need to be addressed before anyone's views could change. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you sir. Um, it's an opportunity at this time for the Mr Benny the agent for a right to reply to any points raised by any party here by the committee but no new information coming forward for yourself just a right to reply to anything that's been said that you want to respond to. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, convener. I'll keep these comments as brief as I possibly can. Um, in respect of uh, the impact of the proposed development on local healthcare provision, it's my understanding that the NHS have still to reply in terms of their consultation response on the application. So at this stage, it's not possible for any party to say whether there are any actual issues of concern, although I do appreciate there are perceived issues of concern. In terms of the impact of the proposals on the educational infrastructure within the catchment schools, both at secondary and primary levels, um, as I said within my earlier presentation, the Council's Education Service haven't offered any objection to the application and are satisfied that the implications can be dealt with by way of appropriate developer contributions. Issues in relation to loss of green space, the, the, the site doesn't form part of the Council's um, allocation of green space as open uh, as set out with an open space strategy. Uh, so whilst yes, it will uh, ultimately result in the development of a previously undeveloped area of land, it doesn't result in and of itself in the loss of any designated or formally protected area of open space. Um, in terms of the impact of the proposed development on 
the amenity of existing occupiers within the area and taking up on the point that uh, when purchasing a house in the area, one of the uh, objective respondent, Mr Crawford, mentioned that they took the time and effort, um, and I applaud them on this, to, to see what might be happening in the area surrounding where they were planning and buying. Now, it's an unfortunate fact of the development planning process that things change and evolve in areas over time. Um, so buying a house one year doesn't guarantee that the next year the council doesn't evolve plans for the development on land, which at the time any searches were done wasn't earmarked for development. Um, so it is unfortunate, but as I say, things do change over time. Um, and finally, uh, there's been no indication or no suggestion by any party um, that the site contains any protected species. Um, so from that point of view, yes, there might be a displacement of wildlife that uses the site either for commuting routes or on a transient uh, and non-permanent basis. Uh, but I'm not aware, and it's not certainly not been brought to my attention thus far, that there are any suggestion of a protected species in the site, um, which would render the site of being incapable of development as proposed by my clients. Thank you. OK, thank you, Mr Benny, for your uh, right of reply. It's now an opportunity for members of the committee to question any party heard by the committee or may seek guidance on factual or legal matters from council officers after each of the presentations. Councillor Redmond. Well, thanks. Um, it was just about the, like the rush hour at the school. Is, is the problem that people tend to park in the street at Glen Devon Drive, is that is that what causes the issue, or is it is it just the volume of traffic? Or is, is it park people are parking in the surrounding streets? Is that, is that could somebody coming in that please? Everybody brings. I, I, I stay in the area, so um, it's a bit both. There's obviously increased traffic during the peak school hours um, uh -huh. uh, at nine and three. Um, people obviously parking on the roads. Uh, so it's basically an increased volume. Right. All right. Right. Thank you. Thanks, Claire. Questions? That's great. I'll be as, as quick as possible. With regards to the objector's statements, I'm sure Kevin will have noted most of them down and hopefully bring back responses in the report. One thing that I, I am concerned about, convener, and we've had it in numerous plan applications previously, uh, it was highlighted by one of the objectors, but also by Mr Benny, the response from Fort Valley uh, it has been not helpful in the past. I could put it that, I didn't want to be uh, to negative, but has been as the response has been very unhelpful for applications. So I can think of one or two that it went a couple of years before they even responded. So that will be key if that's an issue for objectors that we get response from. Uh, Fort Valley, and whether it's no, we haven't got a problem. Yes, we have got a problem, but developer contribution will be required. It would be nice to get that information. Uh, convener. Thanks, Convener. I'll bring Mr Dryden in because this has been a long standing problem for all members and officers in relation to getting the feedback. Mr Dryden. Yeah, thank you for you, Convener. Yeah, I think uh, Councillor Kerr and all those on the committee, you, you're raising a valid point and it has been something of a concern uh, with with obviously this application, as you note, you have yet to receive a response and that is something that we're mindful of. There is a high level group that has been uh, obviously engaging with our colleagues in the Fourth Valley and uh, I will certainly take that offline from today again to try and we have to ensure we get a response uh, before we bring this actually report back to you for your consideration and I'll take it offline and discuss that with Mr McGuinness, um, who I believe is certainly is a uh, planning, I think, at some point to, to meet with the, the, the Fourth Valley Point of Parks uh, on, on the, the wider issue of 
development and planning for development and the, the, the impacts that the development will have on care facilities. I thank you, Mr. Dryden. I think I, I don't understand them because anything that comes forward for development uh, as enhances their, their, their own uh, NHS. Um, Councillor Bowes. Thank you, Convener. Sorry, uh, ju I'm just checking, Convener, that we're at the part where we can ask for information to come back uh, for the actual uh, planning no, committee. We're not, no, we're still at members of the committee invited to question any party, so we're still at okay. that. Uh, but I'm, too, I'm too early then, I will, I will early, track I'll my ask hand. Any other, any other questions before we went to intend to identify the, any issues that weren't brought forward? <laughs> any other questions? Can we go straight into that? Okay, Councillor Bowes. Okay, so... I'm going to I'll either read out the whole of section four for you or I'll try and pick out the, the bits that are here. Um, so you've got the, the first 4.1, um, the engineering design unit, and they're asking for details in there for particularly, uh, um, it's not possible to carry out, a, um, carry out even a basic assessment under the current road safety policy and guidance is the opinion and engineering design unit that the plan permission should be withheld until such time the applicant supplies sufficient information to assess the application. If we can get that information, there's number one. So I'm trying to cut out a lot of the reading here, so, so just uh, bear with me. Um, transport unit um, is also, uh, this is 4.2, transport unit is also highlighted uh, uh, without improvements uh, in bus services. The, again, they're asking for information. Um, uh, again, again, they said it's not possible uh, for a full assessment of the transport impact of this development surrounding the network to be carried out. Can we get the information so that they can get, get us that? Uh, I'm glad it's not all of four, but there is, I'll, I'll keep going. Um, the contaminated land assessment, I think, is, is obviously very important given there's uh, a mining history uh, up, up in the area. I think um, that, that also becomes important. I think also given the, 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 uh, the Coal Authority mapping records um, are, are there as well. A coal mining risk assessment should, should be required for us, for us to take this forward because if it's high risk, then obviously uh, would you want to use that site? Would we want to be passing that site? If it's not a high risk, then obviously that would be a, a, on the positive side. Scottish Water, um, can we get, can they confirm, or can we get the information to them so that they can confirm whether the development can actually be serviced? Um, because that's on item 4.5. Uh, SIPA again are asking uh, for more information. I don't know if you get that right away because sometimes um, they, they'll come later. However, they talk about nearby water courses, surface water. Um, and I know in the past that's been a problem in, in other projects uh, in the same area where there has been an amount of flood flooding. 4.7 we can miss that because there is some information in that, except for we would probably like a more, uh, an indicative number, as I think um, Councillor Redmond had asked for uh, earlier on, um, of units. Um, the NH Fourth, NHS Fourth Valley is something we have said how, how many times. Uh, and I'll stop at 4.9. The flooding team uh, have, uh, have indicated that a flood are, I say, risk assessment and drainage impact is required. I think given the, the, the problems we've had with other projects up in, in the same area, I think that's kind of important uh, that we get that before we make decisions on this. Hopefully that's enough and you hopefully you've caught, caught it all. I, did, I, didn't, I didn't want to read out the whole the section four, but I tried to pick out the, some of the relevant points which will assist in making the, the right decision in whichever way that whichever way that goes in the future. Thank you. Thank you for your input, Councillor Bowes. Councillor Sinclair. Thanks, convener. Um, just a, a, a couple of uh, questions on, on uh, some information I'd like to see. Um, there's been talk about the, the site not being open space, but it is biodiversity space. I'd like to see a bit more information on the loss of biodiversity, given I know it's a, a planning permission in principle, but the, the, it's important to, to understand the impact of losing such a large site, which could potentially contain a, a fair bit of biodiversity there. Um, 
Also, g given the proximity of the site to both the manual and guard room burns, my understanding is that there's parts of the manual burn do have protected species, but perhaps not at this site. I wondered if we could maybe perhaps get some confirmation from either Nature Scott or Bug Life Scotland or wherever might be able to might hold that information. Um, uh, the, the, the third part on that, um, uh, that I know that there are um, a level of a number of trees on site, <clears throat> if there are any that are subject to a TPO, um, and what there may be any plans in place to either um, protect some of the trees that are there or for the replanting of trees that may be lost uh, in any future uh, planning application that may come forward. Um, uh, Councillor Bowes mentioned the contaminated land. Um, thanks for bursting my bubble on that one, um, but that would be uh, uh, that, that would be, uh, be handy to have more of that information as well. Uh, thank you, convener. OK, thank you. I think that everybody realises, and I think if they stay one here, that there is an awful lot of information still to be required. And I'm quite sure that the, the applicant's agent and the officers will be getting together, but I don't think it will be any time soon. We're not looking at bringing this back at the, the next um, uh, available committee, uh, because there is an awful lot of information here, and obviously, um, and I'll, I'll just repeat myself that it's imperative and important for everybody that we go back up and have a look at this at this site. OK, uh, Councillor Murta, just to finish off, thank you. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I would I would ditto both my previous my colleagues' contributions. Um, just one matter, because it's been said a, a few times that in the report, the, the education contributions have been uh, listed and that there's not said to be a problem in terms of capacity. And um, But I would like to, obviously, given, given that we don't know how many units this actually reflects to, to ensure that um, there's a you know a, an assessment of how education have uh, come to that at the moment. It's a, it's a, this would be the, the figure that would be required. But given we don't know the actual capacity um, that we're judging against, can we have some clarity from officers about how that's how that statement has come about and how that's being judged? Would be helpful. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Well, I think that draws a close to this predetermination here. It's been, it's been very beneficial for everybody. And um, I would just like to, on behalf of Councillor Keller, my Deputy Convener, and the officers around the table, and the officers there, and members, and members of the public who confirmed their attendance and, and came to object to this application, I'd like to thank you all very much and a safe journey home. Thank you. Thanks, Convener.